Microwave, if you've never heard of me, you don't know me from a bar of soap, I'm a whole, yeah, whole new entity to you, lovely to meet you, I love it. Because I've been around for a while and just when you think you've saturated the nation and everyone's over you, it's great to meet new people. <laughs> and um, I, uh, I, I've come with a not so hidden agenda to receive tonight, like for me personally. And a uh, big thank you. Pastors Corey and Simone for uh, your warm welcome and the opportunity to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a fireball into the place. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something tonight. I felt as I was sitting uh, there during worship, the Lord said to me, Vicky, this is the season of redefinition and I am redefining you. And I felt to say that there are those among us here tonight, and God is redefining you. And there are things that we have not known as we should. We've we've thought we've understood. We've thought we know what that means and what that means. But I feel the Lord saying that in this season of redefinition, we are going to understand some things like we have not understood before. And what's more? We're going to see there are some things we've called sacred. They're not sacred at all. There's some things we've added value to. God doesn't value at all. And so who's up for a redefinition? Some of you are going to be so turned on your heads. You're going to sow the way. And I even felt for myself, kind of just speaking personally, I'm there and, you know, even as a minister who, I go with the flow, right? That's been my modus operandi for 30 years, this is my 30th year full-time ministry. And thank you, that's, that's lovely. Uh, <laughs> I've discovered, just keep doing what you're doing for one day after the other, and then suddenly you've been around a long time. That's what I've, disc- that's what I've discovered. Suddenly they get you in speaking on longevity and they call you a legend. It's only because you keep turning up and you haven't gone away. That's what, I, that's what I've discovered. <laughs> so, but I, I felt, I felt, as I was there, I kind of felt like my, my patterns, my rhythms, my modus operandi, right? If someone goes with the flow, you know, we have certain, certain, you know, patterns and rhythms and do you hear what I'm saying? And I feel like the Lord was saying to me, Vicky, they're going to get, they're going to get disrupted. They're not going to work anymore. Like, like, you know, the, the way you have known to do things, those things that you have felt comfortable in. And, and I really feel that that is a very important part of what God is doing. And, that, and to be in, in that place of, of, of saying, okay, bring it on, brother there with the stamp. What's your name? Jordan. Stand up, Jordan. Is that okay? It doesn't matter if it's not okay. It was like, hey, I'm not. If I stand up, <laughs> I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a page out of your playbook, Pastor Corey. You know, it's, I was like, hey, let's do it. But there's a, <laughs> there's a redefinition coming for you. Yeah, redefinition coming for you. In actual fact, I can see it's not the square peg in the round hole, but it hasn't been a perfect fit. It's kind of like the square peg has been kind of forced into there and so edges have been knocked off and there has been, you know, um, a shaping, a a fitting of sorts. But hear the Lord saying that there's the perfect fit coming and the perfect fit is not what you would even imagine and even how other people have defined you. Hear the Lord saying, think again. Think again. There's going to be a thinking again of you, of, you, of yourself, but even see others yeah. thinking again about Jordan. And then I see you being extracted from that place where you're like the peg rammed into the hole. I see you being extracted and then I'm seeing you being eased in to another shape, to another, another fit, right? In Jesus' Name, Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let me share a vision I had in recent weeks. And it was of this. I saw a friend of mine, a pastor, and he was in position with the Lord Jesus to dance, like a waltz. 
Actually, it was. It was like just there ready to waltz. And, and his posture was great and he was, uh, you know, looking, looking at his feet and very intent on doing it all right. And in this dance, though, it got a bit clunky. And he kind of, oh, ouch. He sort of started stepping on Jesus' feet, you know. Oh, ow. <laughs> Anyone been in that situation where, you know, someone's stepping on your feet? And, and then I, I saw the Lord lovingly look at him and say, let me lead. Wow. Wow. Come on. Let me lead. Because my friend was actually, had taken the lead wow. in the walls. And I feel that the word of the Lord to us tonight is simply, let me lead. And it brought my memory back to when I was a little girl. Um, don't be fooled by the Simpson name. I've got Italian blood in these veins. So growing up in my Italian family, I, I look forward to family weddings and, and, you know, birthdays and celebrations. And I always wanted to dance with my Uncle Rocco. Because Uncle, Uncle Rock, as I call him, Uncle Rock... In addition to many things, was actually a dance instructor. He taught people to dance. And I used to love, as a little girl, dancing with Uncle Rock because he would say, don't worry, I'll lead. And I'm telling you, for those few moments, I felt like I could dance. In hindsight, I actually think I was standing on his feet, I think. But because he knew what he was doing, and he would just, it's just like instinctively, I would be moving in all the right places because he had taken the lead. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 20 says, One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. So this was the time, the very first time, where Jesus called men to be his disciples. So in this case, Peter and Andrew, and his words to them, the first words was, was this, come, follow me. Yeah, yeah. So the first calling, yeah. the first calling was to follow. Everyone say follow. follow. And there really wasn't any negotiation. There wasn't much explanation. There wasn't a lot of elaboration. Wow. It was simply this, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And when he, the next, he, uh, he sees James and John. And it's the same. It's the same calling. Come, follow me. And I believe today he wants to remind us that first and foremost, our calling is to be followers. Followers of Jesus. And I find it amazing. All the disciples heard was follow me. And they left everything. They left it all. I find it mind-blowing because there was no precedent at that stage, right? They were the first. And they left it all to follow Him. I mean, I did the same in 1992. The Lord called me, called me to Brisbane. I'm a Perth girl and... I went to Brisbane for five months to do a prophetic training school for my own personal development with full intention of going back to my job, my family, everything I knew and loved in Perth. And with only days to go, I mean, days to go. And what's more, I'm spending what little money I had left because I thought I was going back to my cushy job back in Perth. And there I was walking along the waterfront on the Redcliffe Peninsula in Brisbane and the Lord I call it the God shout, the God shout. Someone tonight needs to know God can shout when he needs to. People get very anxious 
right? Very anxious about the will of God and the voice of God and, you know, because it's still and small, right? God's voice is still and small. That was the experience of one depressed prophet in a cave and we have made it a doctrine. It's true, right? Yes, God whispers. He does whisper. I've known the God whisper, but I've known a shout that nearly knocked me off my feet. And the shout was this, don't want you to go back to Perth, I want you to stay. I didn't know what for. I was living in a cockroach infested caravan at the time. I'd run out of money. And, and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to ring my parents, which if there's anyone here of Italian heritage, <laughs> to be a single daughter and you're ringing up and telling them you're gonna live somewhere where they're not. <laughs> it was not easy, it was not the easiest phone call I've ever made. <laughs> still traumatised by the thought of it. But I, I, I obeyed and I did what the Lord told me to do. And, and I, I stayed and I left it all. I remember ringing my boss back in Perth and for the first time in my life, I had been headhunted and offered a position back there in 1992 where I would have been earning, let's just say a lot of money, a lot of money. And I was letting go of that opportunity I was letting go of all the comforts. I was letting go of all the issues. I was letting go of the church family that I had known for many years. And just everything that was familiar, familiar to me, for what? I did not know. At that point that I made the decision, I did not know. All I knew is that it was the call to follow. To follow. Now, I had their example to follow. Peter and Andrew, James and John had gone before me, but they had no precedent. Come on. Come on. They were the first. There is a sense in which you guys are the first. There is a sense to which the call amongst you is to go before. You're breaking through some things, right? Not just for this city, not just for this state, but for this nation. And just like these disciples, they were able to let it all go and to follow. Because why? Why? I tell you why. Because they heard. They heard. They heard His voice. Come, follow me. There is no following without the hearing. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I've travelled this nation for 30 years. And I'm telling you, for the last 10, there's hardly a church that hasn't been looking for the silver bullet of discipleship. There's hardly a pastor that isn't looking for the secret source of discipleship. And they try this, and they try that, they try something else. But I tell you, this is where discipleship comes from. From hearing and following. There is no following without the hearing. My sheep, hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. So it's impossible to disciple people without empowering them and releasing them to hear God's voice for themselves. You know your pastor is not your high priest. (laughs) You know he is not the mediator between you and the Father. And yet we have had cultures within this nation that our church leaders have been like Moses going up the mountain, coming back down with the Ten Commandments. I've heard God for you. That's not going to be the way of the future. That is not the way of this new era. I could possibly be excommunicated for saying this in some some environments, but I believe with all of my heart 
It's not about the vision coming down from the mountain. It's not the vision of the house. It's the vision in the house. And God is empowering His people like never before. Like, like I mean, unprecedented in this nation. The Lord gave me another vision. It was in January 2019, literally weeks before the whole COVID, like only a couple of weeks before the whole COVID you know, hit the, you know, arrived in Australia. And um, it was of this, it was of a bodybuilder. And a bodybuilder was flexing his muscles in the mirror and super, super big biceps, right? Super big biceps. And then the vision panned out and the bodybuilder had skinny legs. <laughs> Looked so stupid <laughs> on it. And I went, what is that? And the Lord said, it's my church. I he said, tell them they've become top heavy. They've developed a few muscles at the expense of the others and tell them to start training for function, not image. He also said to me, Vicky, the church in Australia is far too impressed with itself. But I see what he's wanting to do. He's doing a number of things right now. You see, the head is getting reconnected to the body. And he is wanting the whole body. We're going to, one of the redefinitions, we're going to go from a house of God focus to a body of Christ focus. So There's going to be these shifts. We're going to, it's going to be more about the God of the house and house of God. It's going to be about the body of Christ rather than the house of God. And I'm not dissing the house of God, please get me wrong, but I feel like we have, we ha, we are, have lost something. Yeah. We've lost something in relation to the New Testament revelation that we are His, yeah. Yeah. His house. Yeah. You are God's temple. Right. Right. We are the lively stones which form together to make, make the temple of God. You, get, you hear what I'm saying? Not in my notes, so I might be freewheeling a bit. I'm all over the show. I've totally left them. <laughs> but I think the body, the body, the body. And I think God wants to bring us back to this revelation of following, of following and empowering people to hear His voice. Can I just speak to any of the pastors here right now? Those of you who perhaps, you know, you're in leadership in some way, you're discipling people. So someone comes to you and says that God has told them. God has, t God told me. Now, in some environments, that's become like the unforgivable sin. To say, God, I feel that God wants to bring a healing here tonight. There are some of you here and God wants to bring a healing because of the impact of, of judgment and control and wounds from environments that hurt you and confused you. And actually right now, what, I, just, I just sense the anointing of God right now because it's your God-given right to hear from the Lord. You are his sheep and you hear his voice. And it's our responsibility to empower people, teach people, to hear. So when someone comes and says, God told me, our, res our response is not to be, oh, well, that's the end of conversation, isn't it? We can't. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that narrative. There is a narrative. Not common here, but other places. And some of you have come from other places and that narrative has wounded you and has robbed you of your confidence because you thought you could hear. Because when someone comes and says, God told me, that's not the end of the conversation, that's the start. Yeah. It's the start of the conversation. Wouldn't it be amazing if someone says, God told me, we go, that's awesome. 
Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that rather than saying, well, can't talk, can't talk anymore. Like, well, well, if God told you. I've noticed, I've noticed in, in this nation, in the Pentecostal churches, there's a bit of a mix. There's a bit of a mix. We send one message and practice something else. God's getting rid of the mix, the mixture. Getting rid of the mixture. We speak liberty and practice control. Oh, I never said that before from a platform. <laughs> the problem. I'm obviously feeling very safe and secure here. <laughs> but this mix, we're Pentecostals and yet. And so for those of you right now and you, and you have been wounded and lost your confidence because you, you, you heard, you believe you heard. Now we all know just because someone said God said doesn't mean that he did, right? We all know that. Right, they come to you and God's told me and you have to tell them, well, no, God hasn't told you to leave your husband to run after her husband. That wasn't God, right? Okay, some people do hear all sorts of crazy. But, so like, no, sweetheart, that's, that's not, well, I'll tell you why that's not the Lord. Let's have a look at the Word of God, right? But I feel like God wants to empower people afresh in this area, right? It is your God-given right to hear and to follow. There is no discipleship without it. No discipleship without it. It's not just the cherry on the cake. This prophetic ministry, I nearly cried. Actually, I was really fighting back the tears. I thought, I've still got a minister and I don't want, you know, I have worn waterproof mascara, but I'm thinking I'm still got to hold it together because when my, my brother and sis, sister's prophets came up here and they walked up here, Oh, I saw them. There was just, there's honour on them. I thought they're being honoured. And just, you see them standing in their callings and their anointings. And, and I just, I just thought they looked so regal. Because it's not common. It's not common. Because sometimes these gifts have been treated like the cherry on the cake. It's a nice added extra. It's a bit of dessert. It is the cake. It is the cake. And have you ever considered this? I considered this, these disciples. They received a word from Jesus, come follow me. Come, follow. But they received a word, but they received a word from the word. They received a word from the word. Jesus, the word made flesh. A word from the word is commonly known as a rhema. It's, I think it's like, I don't know, is this the first example of a rhema word of God in the New Testament? I don't, I, I don't know, but I thought to his disciples, to those who are, who are followers. I mean, it's, 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 I think firsts are very important. It, there's a law of firsts, isn't there? I'm no theologian, but it, it's important. It's significant. And that word, I might need a tissue. <laughs> Oh yeah, I've got, I found one in the pocket, but I'll take a fresh one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but that word, that rhema, it activated faith in their hearts and it compelled them and it cap catapulted them yeah. into the plan of God. That's that simple call. Come, follow me. Brought radical change. They left everything and followed. It was a game changer. Yeah. For the last 20 years or so, we've had such a big focus on leadership in this country. We've got the biggest leadership biceps in the world. I'm telling you. Leadership training, 
leadership conferences, leadership books, leadership podcasts, which is great. There's good, some good stuff for leaders. <laughs> and leadership is only one yes. gift, yes. one yes. of many. Yes. And I'm, I've, I've, I've been looking into it, I'm like, Lord, show me, show me. I, and I struggle to see that it's more important than any other. I, I, I'm just being honest, as I, it is a, a part of the body, but even Romans 12 alone, which incidentally throw this in, into, the, into the midst, um, I believe Romans 12 is a prophetic chapter right now. And in Romans 12, it talks about the motivational gifts, like the gifts of the Father. And leadership is one yeah. of seven. You know, even in the Ephesians 4.11 gifts. You know, I think we've had this idea, like the apostle is like the type A personality that makes things happen. And like apostles go first. That's a part of the pioneer. But the fathering, the fathering, that's what you're carrying, Corey. God has been birthing that, those, those, something's been breaking on the inside of you. It's like I see, I shared it with you on the phone. You went through a breaking during the whole COVID lockdown. God gave me a vision of you pulverised to powder. <laughs> it's like, I actually... <laughs> and so there was, there was a, 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 a breaking. And I honestly believe, I said to the Lord, why Numa? I said to the Lord, why Numa? And I believe two things. Probably not the only things, but here you've been, here you are in the most locked down city of the world. Isn't it typically God to break out, right? Break out something that the enemy locked up. I don't know. Did I, did I go too far then? I don't know. <laughs> This city suffered, this state suffered, this church suffered, your leaders suffered, you all suffered. Suffering is God's preparation. That, that when you suffer well, you carry something, something you are, fer- you are soil that's been tilled, prepared for God to break out. So that's number one. That's, but number two, is that your church honours the, the fivefold. Yeah. It, is, it is built, the pillars, your pillars, the fivefold pillars. You read Ephesians 4. Yeah. You look at the fruit of when you have the five in action, the five working together. And I said, I said to your pastor that I've, even though you're way ahead of the curve in comparison to, you know, some play, other places, you're way ahead of the curve in comparison to what God is yet to reveal. It's still, still, it's still, and the revelation has been pouring. It's like God's turned on the tap. <laughs> deluge. I had a picture of a waterfall, a waterfall. And what's that? It's the deluge of revelation, the deluge of, and I believe that the teacher is going to be risen up in, in an indifferent to how the teacher was expressed like, in the, you know, a former era, because I'm seeing the teaching and the prophetic together. So, okay, teachers explain, very simplistic definition, right? Explain, when they're teaching from the Word, explaining the Logos, explaining what God has said. But when you have a prophetic teacher, you get a teacher explaining what God is saying. Hear the difference? And I believe prophetic teachers, like Pastor Stacey, you've got a prophetic teacher in your midst, prophet and teacher. I'm saying they carry both mantles. We're going to see a proliferation of them. Because there's new stuff, right? There's new revelation, the redefinition, stuff that we've got wrong. 
We're going to have these big aha moments. We are going to have some rude awakenings, people. It's like, what? You mean that's not in the Bible? What, that, what, that, that, that's not God, that wasn't God? Yeah, be ready. Just because it rhymes doesn't mean it's God. What is wrong with me tonight? I don't know what's going on. Oh, dear. Oh. And so, where are my notes? Where am I? <laughs> oh, yeah, this is, this is good. You know, I declared you're, lead, you're leading the way. You, 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 God is, you're pioneering, right? You're pioneering some stuff for this nation. But let me say this. For the Lord say, not to be a template and not to be a model. I know, I know many in conversations I have, people waiting for this new model. Okay, God, we know God's doing a new thing. We're just waiting for the new model. A pastor said to me recently, we're waiting for somebody else to do it. We've got the model, then we can do it. No model. There's actually not going to be, this new era is revelatory. Right. Yes, you, you know, we can be inspired. Ones will be inspired. The anointing, what you carry, is not just going to be what you do and say, it's going to be what God does with that, right? And so... You know, there'll be, there'll be leadership and example and there'll be mentoring and covering. Ha, huh, that's the other vision I had. The Lord gave me a vision for you. I was on the plane and it was of a huge umbrella. Huge umbrella, huge. And under that umbrella, all these people were huddled for shelter. Right? They were, just imagine the biggest flippant umbrella you've ever seen in your life. And all these people huddled. And I thought the Lord say that like that umbrella, that pneuma is going to bring, it's going to bring covering. It's going to bring covering. But covering, but not as you've known it. God is redefining the word covering. And I saw these people, and, the, and, and I felt the Lord draw my attention to the fact that they were huddled in. They were close. They were close. But you know what? There was no, it's, it's not like they were, they weren't roped together. There was, you know, there were no other fixtures there was nothing keeping them except their desire to be close. Wow. And so I believe that, yes, you, you've got an apostolic, you're an apostolic hub. Yeah. And apostolic hubs have a function in the body that is unique and that is powerful. But God doesn't want you to be the pool of Bethesda where people come just waiting for a stirring of the waters, yeah. hoping they'll get a miracle. In fact, what I see, I see what's happening here, the revival happening here is going to be more like the river of God. The river of God, like in Ezekiel 37, it flowed out from under the doors. It, flew, it, it flowed out from under, under the door, started with a trickle, if you remember, then it started to travel down the mountain. And remember, and then it built, it was to the ankles, to the knees, and then remember the waters to swim in. And so what's happening here, you're going to see the greatest miracles out there. You're going to see the greatest miracles out there. You're going to see more salvations out there than what you're going to see in here. Because you are carrying the river, rivers of living water flowing out of your innermost beings. So you, you, you're, not, you're not the pool of Bethesda. You're not just the model or template for people to follow. Because God wants, God wants places. It wants revelation. It'll be revelation for places, contextual. The pastor's here tonight. God's got revelation for you. That's contextual. That, and it's not that you won't glean and get insight because we have the mind of Christ, right? We, not me, we. So revelation is always, the fullness of God's revelation comes in concert with other people, right? And so, but there's going to be something. I don't know where you are, you pastors, but there's going to be revelation that's contextual and that's relevant for you personally. Perhaps the worship team can return, please. 
So we're not all leaders, that's just one. One of the motivational gifts. It's not, it's not actually one of mine. I'm a bit lower down the list. <laughs> Don't ask me to lead anything. I come to something someone else leads and make a bit of a noise. That's what I do. <laughs> but we are all followers. We are all followers. It'd be great, wouldn't it, be have some followership training? Numa School of Followership. <laughs> but there was a second part to the vision of my friend in the waltz with Jesus because he was looking, looking down at his feet, looking at the, looking, right? Get the steps right. Get the, you can tell I can't waltz. Get the, get the steps right. Get the steps right. You know, and like, oh. And the Lord said, don't look at my feet. Look at my face. And it reminded me actually when uh, I got married. I married my opposite. Anybody else? Polar opposite. He has only been two occasions where my husband and I have danced together. One was at our wedding. And another one, what Reese was at a family wedding recently, and that was only because his niece dragged him and forced him onto the dance floor. And so he agreed to do the bridal waltz at our wedding on one condition it had to be choreographed. I'm like, babe, I'm happy to do the. You know, just a two foot shuffle, you know? Snuggle, snuggle, smooch, smooch, just a bit of a shuffle. No, we had to do Dancing with the Stars, right? <laughs> and the very thing that made him feel secure and more confident was the exact opposite for me. It was so stressful. And I remember we tried to, you know, all this woo hoo, all this, you know, fancy hoo ha sort of stuff. And our dance instructor said, stop looking at your feet. When you're just concentrating on the steps, it becomes so robotic. Look at each other's face. And Vicky, you've got to trust Damien because he's leading and you've got to trust him. Trust that he is, you know, he's going to look out for you. That if you're about to bang into a wall, he'll whoosh, he'll spin you around so you don't. I feel we've been a bit obsessed with steps. Right? It's the steps, you know, the motions, going, the stuff we've got to do. And there's no intimacy without the face. I love the image of the dance because, I mean, you can go through life without dancing. I mean, it, it's not like dancing is essential to life. It's just such a beautiful metaphor, the divine dance. God wants us to engage in a divine dance. Where it's not just being worried about His feet and the steps that we take, but that we are focused on His face. Second Corinthians 11.3 I've had this Scripture on my heart for a long time for our nation. And it's this, I'm afraid that even as the serpent beguiled Eve by his cunning, that your minds may be corrupted and led away from the simplicity of your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. That your minds have been led away, led away. I ask the Lord, has something else other than you been exercising leadership over my mind? Lord, have I been led away, even with all good intentions, even those of us who love the Lord, you know, we're doing our best to follow Him. Some of you here, God's been reviving you because you've been exhausted just by the sheer pursuit of serving Him. too complicated. Yeah, it became complicated. 
became burdensome. Come unto me, or you were weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. My burden is light, my yoke is easy. Easy, easy, ease, ease. God's bringing back the ease. God, I hear the Lord saying, He's just said to me then, God, He's, He's restoring the ease. It's going to become a, uh, a measure. It's going to become a, it's like I, I see you, even as, as a leadership team is, yeah, you're going to be able to tell, you're going to be able to tell when you're getting into striving and you see performance, performance. We've confused excellence of spirit with excellence of performance and excellence of performance can breed anxiety. We've had anxious cultures. God's delivering. I've heard it all service. God moving people and anxiety. Some of you, you know, you've kind of, is it good enough? Have I done well enough? You know, is it, is it right? Those of you in, in, you know, worship team, you know, worship teams in this nation, you know, it's been, it's been anxious business being excellent. But excellent spirit is a different thing. Excellence of spirit is different to excellence of performance. It become hard, it become complicated. God's rest- restoring back the simplicity of sincere and pure, pure devotion to Christ.